Okay. Good oh boy. Okay. I didn't hear that because usually you said something. Uh, hang on, this is a setting up for your meeting with YouTube live. <laughs> We got the message about it live streaming, so it seems to be gone. Oh, the yeah. message. Oh, it is okay. Okay, yeah. now it's running. Yeah, it's running now. Yeah, okay. I got a visual message that it was live streaming. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Daryl. Welcome to the what is the three thirteen Los Angeles Astronomical Society general meeting. Welcome, everybody. Um, uh, nice to see some faces that I haven't seen for a while. Yeah, it's really great. Uh, new members, any new members here? Want to say hello? Bruce uh, and Brad, okay. Uh, say something about yourself, Brad. Uh, let's see. Well, um, I like long walks on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> and nice to meet you guys. Um, Brad Marsh, I've, seen, I've, I've met many of you guys out at uh, Garvey um, on Wednesday nights, and I yeah. love meeting everyone else. So, uh, yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> Sure. Nice to have you at Garvey. A, a welcome asset there. Thank you. Uh, Bruce? Hi, everybody. Um, new member from Bakersfield um, and a rookie just kind of learning. We love rookies. <laughs> I'm definitely a rookie, too. They have very open minds. <laughs> Is there a third person over here, Sid? Hey, hey guys. Can you hear me, right? Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Uh, I'm Sid. I I moved to California last year from New England and trying to get into astronomy. So yeah, looking forward to it. Oh, um, good. I, I remember reading your uh, your little blurb on the on okay. the form that you put in. Oh yeah, I remember yeah, you nice. just moved here. Good. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? Brian, you're not new. <laughs> <laughs> just saying hi, just waving hello. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, you know, I don't know that we have uh, uh, let's see, where's my He's a new star member, though. So, that's, that's the thing. He's born. He's a born again. <laughs> okay, I don't know if we have any updates or announcements that are very big that are new. Uh, we do have. Uh, Spencer wants to bring up something about the uh, uh, bylaws. Uh, is... uh, yeah. So the uh, bylaws were uh, bylaws were uh, the revision that we posted in the groups IO couple. Uh, Last time, they've been approved by the board. So there. So if you want to check them out, um, they're posted in the groups I/O under um, uh, the the uh, members handbook section. And that's on the flyer that you got from. Right. Uh, that information is on the flyer on how to get. Right. Yeah. There. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that Andy yeah. sent to everyone. Right. Exactly. All right. Um, uh, the other thing is, we are at one thousand twenty-seven members now. We hit over a thousand. Awesome. Thank you, new members. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you, guys. There's three yeah. here tonight, which is great. That's that's really that's good great. representation for. We had a lot this month as well. Yeah. They're not all listening yeah. tonight, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> We're missing a few members, just a few. Yeah. <laughs> They're just streaming it on YouTube now. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we can have some. We can have committee reports. There's there's really uh, nothing happening at Ford. It's snowed in. Matt Wilson has snowed in, uh, and uh, Garvey's running every Wednesday as usual. All new members ought to go to Garvey. This is where you meet people and learn how to use your telescope, learn about other telescopes. If you don't have one, there's guys there on the lawn with telescopes. You can look at all different kinds. Great place to learn, uh, as, yeah. as, as you know, but this is good. I'm still waiting on my badge, actually, for my ID. Yeah. It's a while before they get uh, printed and sent, but it'll get there. When did you uh, When did you join, Sid? Was it? Uh, this? I got approved uh, last week, early last week. But I okay. So the badge is sitting in my on my on my table on my dining room table. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> why I'm not along with <laughs> along with about twenty five other ones and a whole stack of renewal about the fifty <laughs> membership cards. So those you don't need it to come to garden. Sid just volunteered to help Spencer process the yes. <laughs> So Sid, do you live do you live near Spencer? You can help you can do some of that mailing. <laughs> oh, where does Venice, uh, sorry, where does uh, Spencer live? Near in La Cañada. Uh, I have to Google that. So I'm in Venice, California. So. Okay, Venice. you're you're uh, about you're about 45 minutes to Yeah, that's a long way. All right. 
That, that's Bring all that stuff down to Garvey. We'll help you pack it. Uh, well, I, actually, I talked a friend into coming over on Wednesday to help me, so we'll, Not good. we'll get that done. So I can rather hang out with yeah. that friend than us at Garvey. <laughs> yes, yes, come well, on. Well, Is well, the she, coffee that bad? She, she, she's, she's, she's better company than you guys. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now that explains it. And it won't be raining on his head. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. No, but uh, actually, I had toy. Andy suggested I do that, and I might. But I'm trying to weigh the difference between 45 minute drive to Garvey, and then 45 minutes to an hour's worth of work in the 45 minute drive, which is two hours at home sitting in front of the TV with a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. Um, let's see. What's the other thing? Uh, Lockwood. We've made a lot of uh, progress on Lockwood. We've uh, uh, got the Lockwood committee back up and running with the uh, co-chairs of uh, uh, John and Spencer. Uh, and you guys just had a meeting. You want to bring us up to speed on that? Uh, so Roman had the me- Roman had a meeting for the observatory committee. So Roman, you, you want to report on that? How'd it go, uh, man? Yeah, sure. Uh, so yeah, we had our first meeting just, uh, just an hour ago. Uh, gone through, kind of put an agenda together for things to cover kind of talking about number one you know what the goals are of the of the subcommittee to get the observatory and telescope running and automated how to work with the club to make sure we kind of put together some thoughts and then let the club voice their opinions and desires kind of make sure we cover everybody's needs uh work through the equipment both the photography and all that as well as the computer and automation so uh, got engaged with a couple of people who have had experience running remote observatories, so we're going to get some readouts and uh, experience from that. So I think we're in a good cadence where we are planning to be meeting uh, weekly to kind of uh, work through the items and get a recommendation back to the Lockwood Committee on what we want to do going forward and when. That's great. Uh, did you contact uh, Ray? Um, I did contact Ray. Ray was not able to log in. There was some some technical issues. He just sent me an email afterwards, oh. or like maybe towards the end. So we're gonna work that out. Okay, great. I see. He's here. I see him. Hey, Ray. Hey. How you doing, man? Yeah, I, I, I'm sure that oh, there's Ray. Know, They're com- they're coming up with a good uh, uh, flow chart, and uh, it, it, you know, if I can't get my technical, st- I have to go over to Apple and get some stuff straightened out. It, and if I can't get up and running, I'm sure that. You know, I'll get out there to at least lend a hand. <laughs> okay, all right, good. It's good to have you. You should. It's good to have you on that committee. Thank you. Thank you. And so we also have a chair for fundraising. Uh, that's right, Brian. Um, yeah. And, and uh, tell us a little bit about what you're going to do with this. This is a new a new position uh, for you, and a, a great position for us for you to have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm. I'm very lucky to, this is, this is me, right? Um, I'm very lucky to have Ted Moss jumping on board to help out. And Kevin Gilchrist has emailed me with his um, enthusiastic support. My, my job, my day job is as the executive director of a nonprofit. So I raise funds all the time. We just did a $650,000 build out of my theater. So this is like my bread and butter. I am excited to do some fundraising. I think this group has some, um, has a really smart way of, of building things out. And I think we've got some really good resources and Lockwood, I'm really excited to make Lockwood a, um, uh, a home that people are, are looking forward to going to and spending time in. It's got major so, potential and we're, we're like jumping yeah. on it. This, you know, this past year and this next year, yeah. big changes, yeah. big, big changes. So I, all the people who are uh, not familiar with Lockwood, look on the website, uh, look up Lockwood, see what it's about. Uh, yeah. It's our dark site. Uh, and, and if anybody feels uncomfortable, I know that it, if you read it in the, in the manual, it seems like there's some, a lot of rules about, about um, SCAS. And there, there kind of are, but for good reason. They're not, it's not as scary a place as it might seem at first. <laughs> I know I was kind of worried about my first time going out there um, making mistakes. But if anybody's at all nervous about going out there, call me, email me. I'll go out there with you, introduce you to the place. I'm a big believer in it. It is, it is fantastic. It's such an incredible resource. And the dark skyness of it is totally worth the 75, 80 minute drive 
it is um, unbelievable. So it, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email address is really easy. It's my full name, Brian Ellerding at gmail.com. So if you're also, if you're interested in getting involved in the fundraising committee for this, or if you want to make a donation to the um, upgrade of the Lockwood site, please reach out to me. Um, this is going to be a really fun adventure, I think. Great. Uh, the, the one committee that we're trying to get, get going and haven't done that is we need somebody to chair the, uh, the maintenance committee. So we need somebody who can help take care, help uh, sort of guide and, uh, and help organize the routine maintenance, like with the ceiling, the existing pads, weed abatement's going to be coming up after the, uh, you know, in the spring. And there are just a whole, you know, just a bunch of projects like that that, that, that need attention. So if anybody would like to uh, volunteer to head that up, uh, let me know. Or if you or, know somebody else in the club too. But, or, or volunteer yeah. them because they're not here. <laughs> <laughs> Was there any progress on a source of water, new source? Um, the, the progress that we have right now is um, I've sent a letter to the owner of the property that is to our, is it our north? North. Just to the north of us. Uh, uh, to find out if he's interested in selling that property or leasing us the rights to the well and the tank that is already on that property. So if that goes through, then we'll have permanent water, assuming that the well is still working. Uh, there's a few in the area that uh, have stopped because the water table's dropped. It'll look like the water table might be coming back up, though. <laughs> Did it look uh, so like it had electricity to the pump? There is no electricity to that property, so we would have to run electricity there or have electricity brought to there, which would probably be too expensive. The way that there was the guy that was working that property before, he would bring a generator and run the generator to pump the well, and he'd fill up the tank that there. It looks like that the tank that's sitting on that property uh, from uh, Google Maps looks about the same size as ours, which is about 2,000 gallons or 2,500. So if you run the generator for a while and you got a good flow on that, you fill mm -hmm. that up, you don't have to run it too often. So that's one option. If, uh, if that doesn't happen, the other option is, is I talked to a few people about doing some work on the property and found out that one of the guys has a, a 2000 gallon water truck and um, does another property really close in the area. Actually, he knew um, where we were when I started talking about the property, he goes, oh, you're right behind uh, Daryl Kanky, right? And I go, yeah. yeah, that's our property. So he knows exactly where we are. And he said that he would deliver 2,000 gallons of water uh, when we need it for $200. Oh. So you know, at $200 a shot, if we never get the well, you know, we're still going to be you know, good, so, I guess, in that respect. So, yeah. so we, we don't have a permanent, you know, it's not permanent supply yet, but we have, um, a good source of cheap if we don't get the permit. Yeah, that's not bad. I think they only filled it up a couple times a year. Uh, at Lockwood. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, you know, with with the up with the up use that's coming and the extra bathroom, you know, it'll get used more. But, but that's okay. We got it. We got an okay source. Uh, so that's that's good. Um, and this is also the guy um, that I talked to about doing other work on the property. Um, if we have to put in a septic tank. Uh, this would be the guy to do it. He also is, uh, has the equipment to do um, a base uh, road in, in our property, starting at the gate, going all the way around on the, the one big drive around back to the gate. Um, I figured out after talking to him, we could do that with road base for like $4,500, which is, I think, a fantastic investment because if we got an actual road going around in there, uh, that's compacted in a good road. Everything else that we do after that's going to be a lot easier. Well, um, less dirt the dust. And, and less and less dirt and dust. So, so that may be um, that may be a priority actually um, because it's a not that expensive thing and something. What kind of what kind of material is it, Daryl? It's road base. It's like gravel, but it's it's better than gravel because it compacts better. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, it, it it's what they put down first when they do a road. But, you know, we're not going to pave over it, but the base is a good, is a good base. So we're talking about an eight foot wide uh, uh, path all the way around there. Sounds good. Daryl, is that the same as diatomaceous earth? No, no, not at all. 
Not that, even close. Not even close. Is that a shared road with Kenki? For part of it? Uh, no, uh, uh, that would be starting at our gate. Right. Okay. Oh, I see. From the, not from the. Oh, so when you say not the from road, the round, not from the, yeah, from where our gate is when you drive in, there's that one road that goes all the way around the property and back to the gate, basically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that whole route is about a thousand, I think a thousand feet. They did a perimeter on the map, and uh, he said he could do about, I think he said, uh, ninety feet per truck. And I just figured out the math, and it came out to eleven trucks at. Uh, um, what do you say? 400 a truck. So 4,400. Cool. So I think I'm going to talk to him as soon as we get, as soon as we can get out to the property, which is still like muck. Uh, and who knows what it's going to be after the next rain. Uh, but three inch, three inches of mud right now. Yeah. So as soon as the property is accessible, I, I'm going to be out there with this guy and a plumber and probably an electrician and go over all of the things that we might be uh, need to do. We had somebody make some complaints uh, to the county about our property, about substandard work, something like that. So we needed to take care of that. I'm on that. We're good on that. Uh, that's about it. Really good, big progress at, at Lockwood. It's going to be great. I'd like to comment that uh, Tim is showing off the uh, parking lot at Mount Wilson, what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Did I do all the committees then? Uh, Daryl? Yes, sir. Okay. I just want to do a quick plug. We're scheduled for our astronomy merit badge class at Garvey again this summer on June 14th, July 19th, August 16th. We're getting the flyer posted on the council site this week, and I'll send that through to our uh, club communications to get on our calendar, and I'll post uh, it. And of course, you can always email me as well uh, or, or the board. So uh, those uh, those are Garvey's on Wednesday nights, uh, one in June, one in July, one in August. And of course, we need uh, some extra telescopes because the scouts have to go out, look through telescopes and learn about what type of telescope is and how it works. And club members have been absolutely fantastic about joining in that effort on uh, so a few summer nights. Uh, we're also working on uh, an Astronomy 101 class for uh, the first two weekends in August, the 5th and the 12th. Uh, we're still working on a curriculum that combines telescope practice with theory. Uh, and we will be opening Garvey on two Saturdays uh, in uh, early August, which is a, a new development. So is I will that, certainly. That's for the 101 class? That's for the Astronomy 101 class. That's right. And is that uh, uh, open to everyone? Is that your. Yeah, we're going to. I'm going to have Spencer as soon as we have our curriculum worked out <laughs> and we have the. Uh, we have to let the city know that we're opening on Saturday, which is fine. We just have to let them know. Right. Uh, then we'll do a form for signups. I think maybe we could take up to 20 or so before the classroom is just completely full. But okay. it, there was a fair amount of feedback from membership. They'd like to have a, a basic practice and theory astronomy class. So we're going to do that. In Good. Let's give it a shot. August. Thank you. All right. We'll that's my report. Together. Yeah. Okay. That's enough committee reports. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I think so, too. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that's really uh, that's really it. Uh, we can get to our guest speaker, Claude. I know you're here. How, oh, there he's right there. Uh, His picture's and, right above you on my screen. <laughs> uh, oh no, he's way over there for me. Uh, Tim, you want? <laughs> well, you know, I, I could read this, but Tim, why don't you introduce him a little better than me just reading the thing? <laughs> well, okay, I'll introduce Claude. To start with, he's a physicist, and that's the way to go, right? And and so he's had a, a long career in solar astronomy, uh, McMath, Pierce. He was, uh, I guess, the head observer, chief technologist, engineer, head honcho, or whatever the hell he was. You can tell us at Big Bear <laughs> solar, <laughs> solar Observatory, where they point this, what, this 1.6 meter mirror at the sun and try not to melt everything in sight with it. And of course, in Hawaii, now they have one four meters. It melts everything. But, uh, and it would, so this long career and his master's thesis was on the sun, too. He's going to tell us all about what we know, why we know it, when we knew it, who knew it first, and all that good stuff about the sun. So, Claude, you're on. Okay, thank you. I think my audio is on. 
First of all, let me see if I can figure out how to share screen here. Uh, from current, from the beat. You're sharing screen. Good. Yep. Okay. We can see the entire screen. We can see the whole thing, though. Uh, you see. Uh, see your slides on the side as well. So on the on the bottom, there's there's a little three icons with a right. Uh, yeah, there you uh, go. Yeah. Done. You're ready to go. Okay. Well, um, first of all, thank you. And uh, this evening, um, I intend to give a cursory survey of uh, covering basically how we built the knowledge base of what we know about our spot. But first of all, I'd like to apologize. The points I've necessarily had to gloss over or completely skip feels almost criminal. But what I hope you take away from this is um, how solar astronomy and really all sciences is an incremental process with each advancement building on uh, the discoveries that came before. So is uh, Sir Isaac Newton, so aptly said, if I have seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. We have a couple millennia to cover here, so uh, we better get to it. Ah. That's it. This is here. Hmm. Guess not. <laughs> okay, I have uh, something in my screen covering part of it. Um, first, before we learn about the sun, we need to uh, know something about the Earth. So um, starting a couple hundred years BC, Aristophanes, and um, please excuse through the rest of this talk how I obliterate names, uh, measured the Earth's, actually the circumference, using nothing but really a rod. He was from the uh, Library of Alexandria and uh, knew that on the summer solstice, at local noon in the town of Sirin, ah, there we go, obliterating again. Let's just go with um, modern day Aswan. The sun shone straight down through the local well, not casting any shadow. So, uh, being clever, Aristosthenes um, measured the angle at uh, Alexandria, which is about 800 kilometers north in modern um, units, and measured an angle of uh, 7.2 degrees. Well, of course, Aristophanes didn't have uh, access to a calculator or even modern trigonometry. He did something clever and said, okay, 8.2 over uh, 360 degrees is 1 50th of a, of a uh, full circle. So multiply 800 by the uh, by the that uh, chord there, and the circumference of the Earth comes out to again in modern units about 40,000 kilometers, which um, in current uh, measurements brings that to about 40,075 kilometers, 24,901 miles. I'm looking at my screen. Now, you may notice up in the upper right-hand corner, I will be keeping a tab of uh, where we are in. Okay, okay. Now, oh, now back up. Okay. Now, uh, this comic, well, first of all, I've always been a fan of Calvin Hobbes, but it uh, points out an interesting point that uh, knowing the Angular diameter, angular extent on the sky is not enough to know about an object. You need to know either its real diameter or the distance to you before you can say much about that. So we jump ahead about uh, 1800 years where uh, Kepler, Johannes Kepler in 1619 uh, came up with his three laws of planetary motion. First of all, of course, planets, orbit the sun and, and ellipses. Uh, they trace out equal area and equal time as they go around. And the third law, which we're interested in here, is the 
period of the orbit measured in years squared is equal to the semi-major axis of the ellipse to the third power. Now, um, first of all, if you reduce that to a circular orbit, the semi-major axis, we can just call the radius of the orbit. And um, down in the lower part of the screen, you'll see I tend to show my footnotes of how I work things out. Uh, Kepler from Tycho Brahe's observations knew that the period of, of Venus was about 0.616 years. And uh, working out the algebra that comes to the radius of the of Venus's orbit in astronomical units, that's of course the average Earth-Sun distance, is 0.724, about 0.72. That's great, except uh, nobody knew what an astronomical unit was, how large that is. Uh, so about 50 years later, Edmund Halley made a recommendation or a suggestion that uh, in 84 years, Venus would be transiting the disk of the sun. Being a uh, patient person, he knew that uh, he wouldn't be around, so he encouraged others to uh, take up the task and uh, measure the transit of Venus across the disk of the sun. Unfortunately, clouds in the Seven Years' War prevented anybody from getting any decent data on that, but Venus transits come in pairs every eight years apart. Our last one was uh, 2012, I think it was. And so, uh, a large uh, expedition was formed, sending people to various parts of the Earth to measure the transit in 1769. And uh, they, got, and I hear I say Captain Cook traveled all the way to Tahiti for it. And so, by looking at the parallax from one location on the Earth to another, they were able to see the apparent shift of position of Venus on the Sun. And knowing the um, the angular extent that they measured there and their separation on the Earth, they were able to triangulate and come up with a good estimate of the astronomical unit, which is about 150 million kilometers, 93 million miles. Good enough for us. More accurately, it's uh, 149.6 million kilometers, but this is good enough for our use of here. So with that, knowing the diameter of the, the apparent diameter of the sun on the sky, we immediately knew the solar diameter, um, about 1.39 million kilometers, 164,000 miles. Um, back up a bit to um, Sir Isaac coming up with his uh, universal laws of gravity in uh, 1686, and from that you can um, derive this uh, little formula which shows orbital velocity is equal to the square root of Newton's um, gravitational constant g times the mass of the Earth divided by our orbital radius, the astronomical unit. The only problem is we, well, we know or knew the um, velocity of our orbit since we knew the astronomical unit, the circumference is just 2 pi r, period is one year, which is about three times 10 to the seventh second. So dividing that, the, the circumference by the period, you come up with about 30 kilometers per second. And if you want to know how, again, uh, how that's derived as you take the, uh, this centripetal force must precisely balance the gravitational force pulling in towards the Earth, set those equal to one another, the uh, mv squared over r, set that equal to gmm over r squared, the little m's cancel, one of the r's cancel, take the square root, and you get that answer. So there were only two unknowns we didn't know, g and m. If you could determine either of those, you could determine the other. 
So go ahead to the end of the 18th century. Henry Cavendish measured G, that constant proportionality, uh, using a, uh, a six-foot six torsion bar balance that uh, measured the force between two large, roughly 350-pound balls and a couple of smaller 1.61-pound spheres. Um, the smaller spheres were suspended by a thin thread, which um, Cavendish knew the torque, the force of the torque that would be required to rotate that thing. He brought the uh, the large weights in close to the larger large, to the smaller balls, and was able to measure that deviation, that rotation, measure the torque, and from that was able to calculate the gravitational constant, uh, which was about 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, which um, the number he came out with was actually within 1% of the modern accepted value. From that, immediately, we were able to uh, calculate the mass of the sun, which is just shy of 2 times 10 to the 30th kilograms, about 330,000 Earth masses. And uh, knowing the size and the mass, of course, we get the density about 1.4 grams per cubic centimeter, which is about roughly a quarter of that of the Earth's density. Of course, once Cavendish knew the gravitational constant, we also were able to uh, know the mass of the Earth as well. So where are we? We know the uh, we've come up with the size of the Earth the um, orbital radius of Venus in astronomical units, uh, we've uh, determined the astronomical unit. And also for the sun, that allowed us to determine its mass, its uh, diameter, and its density. So how much energy does the sun generate? Well, flood, and again, I apologize for... Uh, Poyer. Thank you. Claude Poyer. I got the first name. <laughs> Claude Poyer made the first measurements of what's called the solar constant in 1838 using a simple pure, pure heliometer uh, and got a value of 1.228 kilowatts per square meter. In other words, every square meter the uh, sun is radiating down on the top of the sun, Earth's atmosphere with a bit over a kilowatt. Now, on the right here is a uh, picture I found of this instrument. I'm not really fully certain how it works. I think the idea is that you point this disk at the sun, that heats up, and you measure the rate of temperature increase there to get the, uh, the flux impacting that thing. Well, after Poirier, Jules Viollet, all right, Teresa's not making too much of a face. Viollet <laughs> continued Poirier's work uh, in 1975, came up with a, um, a uh, value of 1.7 kilowatts per square meter. Samuel Langley took measurements uh, up on top of Mount Whitney and came up with a whopping 2.903 kilowatts per square meter. And then Charles Abbott, an American name I can pronounce, ran a high altitude program in the first half of the 20th century and got numbers ranging from about 1.318 up to 1.548 kilowatts per square meter. Now, what this really goes to illustrate is it's a difficult measurement to make. Although very simple in concept, you're dealing with the Earth's atmosphere. There are clouds, there's scatter, there's winds, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the way to do it is get above the Earth's atmosphere and uh, use satellites to try to measure the uh, solar constant. That was done with numerous different satellites, and even those had difficulty. Although, um, 
taking a careful look at the instrumentation, recalibrating, and uh, reanalyzing. Eventually, the uh, results are able to be brought into agreement with one another, and we come up with the current accepted value of 1.361 to 1.362. Over the solar constant, that value varies a very small amount by 0.1%. Counterintuitively, the, uh, the output of the spun is highest during the solar maximum when you have the maximum number of spun spots on the spun and lowest at the uh, lowest least number of spun spots. So it's right in the phase with the solar cycle. And here's kind of a cool DIY science project anybody can try. I keep intending to do this someday when I think about it. Take a darkened surface on a, um, on a container of water, point it at the sun and measure the rate of temperature increase in that water. And from there, you can do your own job of calculating the solar constant. And there's a website here at the NOAA that has an activity and specifies the details of how they recommend doing that. So now we know the flux density at the, uh, at the Earth, 1.36 something kilowatts per square meter. Now if we extrapolate that to the entire sphere of radius one astronomical unit, we can determine what the entire output of the sun is. All the, uh, all the radiation coming from the sun has to pass through that imaginary sphere. No, it's not a glass or a crystalline sphere, but it's an imaginary sphere at the, uh, at the Earth distance. And again, if you want to follow my map, check my map down below. You can do that in the lower left-hand corner. One astronomical unit, uh, 140, Oh yeah, 149.6, 10 of the ninth meters, and uh, get the the area of that uh, of that sphere, 2.8 times 10 to the 23 square meters, and then uh, multiply that by the solar constant. You come up with about 3.8 times 10 to the 23 kilowatt. Now that's the uh, what. Uh, 382, 800 billion billion kilowatts. That's a lot of power. And now, um, Earth, as we come into the 20th century, was already known to be billions of years old. No energy source known could sustain that kind of power output, even with the mass of the sun over anything even close to billions of years. Certainly not a big chunk of coal, not gas, not even the gravitational potential of a collapsing body could do it. No energy source was known until, of course, Einstein came up with probably the most famous equation of all time, equals mc squared, which, um, basically tells us that energy on the left side of the equation is inter, um, interconvertible with mass on the right side of the equation uh, through this um, uh, constant of proportionality, this conversion factor of the speed of light squared. And what this really tells you is that even a very small amount of mass multiplied by a huge number, the speed of light, multiplied by that huge number again, gives you a tremendous amount of energy. So that drove the idea that uh, what could possibly drive the output of the sun is a nuclear process, in particular, nuclear fusion. And the idea that uh, hydrogen in the core of the sun, pushing together, take four um, hydrogen nuclei, four protons, fuse them together, 
and create a, a helium nucleus. Now, if you look at the periodic table and look at the atomic mass of a proton, it uh, equals 1.00784, and that's in uh, atomic uh, mass units. Don't worry about that. But then look up a um, helium-4 atom, and it weighs 4.002603. So four protons weigh more than the helium nucleus that we're proposing creating that helium nucleus out of by a factor of 0 0.7. So that mass loss in converting the four hydrogen nuclei, the four protons, to helium is converted to energy, and a lot of it through equals mc squared. And what that tells us is that the um, that the luminosity of the sun, which we've already determined about 3.8 times 7 to 23 kilowatts, is the equivalent of um, 4.26 megatons per second mass loss. Um, now that might sound like a lot of energy, but or a lot of mass loss on the sun. But um, per year, that only comes out to 6.66 .66 times 10 to the 14th minus 14th solar mass per year. In other words, if you converted the entire mass of the sun to energy, you could keep it burning for about 15 trillion years. Well, that can't really happen because, as I say above, that conversion process is only about 0.7% uh, uh, efficient in the conversion to helium. And also, as we'll see in just a moment, the fusion process is, co is confined to just the core of the sun. So the entire uh, hydrogen supply in the sun is not available for nuclear fusion. Now, the process of nuclear fusion in the sun, um, at least the predominant one, is called the proton-proton cycle. There are a couple of uh, variations on, on even the proton-proton cycle, but this is the, hello, Eddie, my cat just ramped my leg. Um, but this is the uh, most straightforward process diagram here, and the one that Everyone is always taught. Now, the proton-proton cycle is a result of a few very unlikely events. And uh, to make to get this to work, the sun has to be extremely hot, greater than about 10 million degrees centigrade, Celsius, excuse me, and extremely dense. The reason for that is. Here we start with, uh, oops, I'm back. There we go. Oh, wrong way. I'm back. There. We start with two hydrogen nuclei, two protons. Now, they're hot. They're moving towards each other fairly quickly. But keep in mind, they both are positively charged electrostatically. And uh, what's going to happen? Well, they're just going to repel one another, move each other apart. So to get the two protons close enough together, they have to be moving incredibly fast so that the their momentum overcomes the electrostatic repulsion and gets them close enough to allow um, um, another force, the strong nuclear force, to keep, take over and to bind those together. Also, of course, they have to be aimed at one another extremely well, pretty accurately. So that is why it has to be extremely hot, is those two protons, those two hydrogen nuclei, have to be moving very, very, very fast to be able to get close enough for the strong nuclear force to take over 
and bind those together. Now, if that does occur, what do you have? You have two protons stuck together. What are two protons in a nucleus? That's helium. Well, you've likely never heard of, of the um, isotope helium-2. That is because it's incredibly unstable. Its uh, half-life is estimated at something far, far less than 10 to the minus ninth seconds. Um, and so basically, almost every time you do finally get two protons to stick together, what's going to happen? They're just going to break apart and go on their merry way again. However, once in a very, very few times, um, less than 0.001% of the time, less than one in 10,000, something very uh, unexpected can happen. One of those protons will spontaneously decay from a proton into a neutron. In the process, it has to expel a, uh, an anti-electron, or if you prefer a positron, to carry away the, uh, the, the positive charge. And to balance the books, it has to also eject an electron neutrino. And what you're left with is deuterium, uh, hydrogen two. Uh, deuterium is, uh, is relatively stable. It has a half-life of uh, 294 years, but um, it is still not completely stable and will happily uh, accept another uh, proton coming in, another hydrogen nucleus, to form up and create helium-3. And uh, because helium-3 is completely stable, it um, has excess energy uh, released in the form of a gamma ray. And then uh, you're left with uh, helium-3, which is completely stable. But after some period of time, that helium-3 can bang into another helium-3. Um, it will have um, it will create a helium-4 nucleus, which is even has a greater packing efficiency, is even, so to speak, it's even more stable than helium-3, and so still has energy. It will, and in the process, will kick out these two protons. So uh, you have two protons left over, which can now um, take take play. Uh, take uh, part in the another cycle of fusion of uh, hydrogen protons. So that's the proton-proton cycle, and that explains why it has to be so hot for fusion to happen, and why it's so hard to create fusion here on Earth, and also why you need such density to get um, much energy output from the sun. Uh, it's a very unlikely event that has to occur, so there has to be enough events going on to create enough energy to keep the star in uh, hydrostatic equilibrium. So the balance of gravity pulling in and the temperature pushing out come into stability. Now, um, the concept of a black body. Uh, if you don't know what a black body is, basically a black body is just a black a, a body that absorbs every wavelength of light. And sorry, there's something blocking part of my screen, so I can't see exactly what it's, what it's telling me here. Um, let me catch up over here. Ah, the, the concept of black body was introduced by. Uh, like Gustav Kirchhoff in 1860. Planck came up with a law that actually describes the energy distribution. Once, um, once a black body absorbs energy, it heats up and it re-radiates in a characteristic curve known as the black body curve. Um, 
Planck's law uh, has a formula that allows you to calculate this characteristic black body curve. And what you find is that as the temperature increases, the total energy goes up and the peak of that energy moves towards the blue. Fortunately, there's a very simple law known as Weems displacement law, which typically says that that maximum temperature is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So the, the wavelength maximum is equal to B, which is just Weems displacement constant, another constant proportionality divided by the absolute temperature. So by using the Weems displacement law, if we look at the shape of the output of the sun, we can actually characterize the temperature of the photosphere, the level that we actually see. And that comes out to about 5,778 Kelvin, or roughly 5,500 Celsius, or uh, 9930 Fahrenheit. Sorry, I don't think much of Fahrenheit anymore. Moving along, uh, in 1814, Joseph Fraunhofer uh, designed and used spectroscopes to uh, look at the sun. And along with uh, this characteristic curve, black body curve, what Fraunhofer found is superimposed on that are these fine absorption features, which are just referred to as absorption lines. Now, uh, they, what Fraunhofer did was he used a spectrograph, which is basically just a, a device where you have a small input slit that allows light in that goes through a dispersing element, in this case, a prism, and then a uh, re-imaging optic. It re-images that slit, but dispersed into that spectrum of wavelengths. And what you find is these absorption features appear as dark bands or dark lines in that otherwise continuous spectrum. Um, not knowing what they were, and Fraunhofer being a good scientist, he started cataloging them, A, B, C, D, et cetera, et cetera. And numerous of these lines are still today often referred to as the Fraunhofer lines. In a uh, high resolution, this is what the uh, solar spectrum looks like, running from the ultraviolet into the infrared. And yes, these dark features running through here, think of those as uh, slit images. Although, yes, uh, I, I corrected people in the past and said, no, this isn't actually from a spectrograph. It's from a Fourier transform spectrograph, but it's meant to look like a slit spectrograph. So I get away with that. And each of these lines are um, what we call are the solar spectrum, and uh, many of them, the brighter ones at least, are what we now still call the Fraunhofer lines. Moving ahead to the 1860s, um, Gustav Kirchhoff and Robert Bunsen uh, used a spectroscope to uh, look at different elements being burned in a clean flame. Uh, Bunsen had developed a, uh, a lamp that burned very cleanly, so it did not, not introduce its own spectral lines. And so into that flame, they were able to put elements and look at the spectrum coming out. And to this day, basically all we ever remember Bunsen for is that clean lamp he made called a Bunsen burner. However, what uh, Kirchhoff and Bunsen found was that Every time they put an element into that flame, which uh, here's a drawing of their spectroscope, input slit here, collimating lens up here, dispersing element, which is just a prism here, re-imaging lens, looking out here, looking at this. They found that every element produced a unique set of spectral lines. And more importantly, those spectral lines corresponded with spectral lines found in the solar spectrum. The conclusion was immediate that, uh, oh, 
the sun is made of these different elements we're looking at. And this allows us to now start to analyze what the sun is truly made of. And here's one of those places where I wave my arms and jump over a tremendous amount of work that was done in the 20th century. I feel very badly having to do this, but I'm going to move ahead and say what was eventually found was the sun basically contains all the elements, all the ingredients we have here on Earth, but in vastly different uh, abundancy. By math, the sun was found eventually to be about 71% hydrogen, 27% helium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, oxygen makes up about 1.5%, and everything else is up to the last 0.5%. Now, moving ahead to one of the truly paramount achievements of 20th century astrophysics, what's known as the standard solar model. This is a set of uh, partial differential equations that are were designed to model the interior uh, of the sun. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to go into, I'm into detail about this. I'm not prepared to go into detail about them, but uh, just uh, suffice it to say, um, one talks about the pressure at uh, every point moving out from the uh, center of the sun to the, to the uh, surface. One talks about the amount of mass in, um, in each sphere going outward at each radius. Uh, one talks about the amount of luminosity generated by each ring moving outward from the uh, center of the sun, and um, also the temperature at each point moving outward. Now, um, the assumption here is that the uh, sun isn't is in uh, hydrostatic equilibrium, meaning it's not shrinking, it's not expanding. And uh, using computers, if these uh, differential equations are solved simultaneously, researchers were able to create models of the conditions throughout the interior of the sun. And uh, what we find is Moving from the uh, from the surface towards the core, not surprisingly, the pressure goes up to extremely high at the core. You kind of expect that with a ball of gas compressing in on itself. The uh, the mass, of course, starts with the entire solar mass, and as you go inward and that pressure density goes up, the mass inside that radius goes down to, once you get to the center of the sun, goes down to zero. And uh, going from the surface at uh, uh, 5778 Kelvin, the temperature rises, not exactly linearly, up through to the core. And importantly, out around 20% of the radius outward hits that uh, 10 million degrees Kelvin that uh, we mentioned earlier for nuclear fusion and continues up to about 15 million at the core. Now, interestingly, looking at the luminosity, almost all the luminosity of the sun is generated within that oh, 20 to 25% radius. That is the region over which uh, nuclear fusion is occurring. After that, um, these photons are are moving outward passively towards the surface, so no more luminosity is generated. Now, this uh, leads to this uh, cartoon diagram you've all seen of the sun with the core at about uh, 15 million degrees C going out to 20 to 25% of the way to the edge of the core, where it hits about 10 million degrees C. Fusion shuts off, 
And after that, um, the photons are doing a random walk, sometimes called a drunken drunkard's walk, outward, moving outward, being, being uh, scattered, moving out, bang, banging around. Think of a pachinko game, slowly coming, uh, coming down with uh, photons. Why? Are we frozen? Oops, you're good on my end. Yes, okay. my video is just on my end. Thank you. Uh, so the photon slowly is working outward uh, and can take uh, hundreds of thousands of years to get out to about 70% the radius of the sun, where it, where the temperature dropped all the way down to about 2 million C down to a chilly 2 million. At that point, some of the uh, heavier elements in the sun can actually start to hold on to um, onto some electrons. If they have electrons, they can create those uh, absorption features we saw in the spectrum before. That increases the opacity of the sun at that level. And um, so no longer is uh, radiation through what's called the radiative zone the most efficient energy transport method. After that, the um, sun breaks into convection. Think of a think of a lava lamp of hot plasma bubbles heating at the bottom, rising convectively up to the surface. Where at the surface, it reaches a uh, chilly 5,500 C. At that point, the temperature and the pressure are low enough where the atmosphere becomes suddenly transparent. The photons are finally released in the space. So now, despite the tremendous success of the um, of the standard solar model showing us the basic uh, parameters of the uh, stellar atmosphere throughout the interior, they um, are one-dimensional models, meaning that they have one value for each point along the radius moving outward. This infers each shell of the sun is complete homogeneous, it's uniform, featureless, and uh, also this model does not include magnetic fields. Well, you've all looked at the sun, and even a uh, casual view of the sun you'll see that uh, the surface is anything but featureless. First of all, well, everywhere on the sun, you see this uh, granulation pattern, which we're actually seeing the, the tops of those convection cells as hot plasma is coming up to the surface, radiation being released, cooling and sinking back down around the edges of these uh, convection cells. But uh, what I really want to point to here are sunspots and uh, flares and NH alpha filaments and prominences become visible. All these are products of the sun complex convoluted magnetic field. How do we know that? Well, thanks to something called the Zeeman effect, which was first observed by George Ellery Hale. You might uh, note a slight uh, Southern California bias here. For that, I am completely unapologetic. Um, yes, in 1908, Hale had heard about something called the Zeeman effect, where what that is is um, a some spectral lines in the presence of a magnetic field will eventually will broaden and eventually split into multiple components. The um, splitting, imagine this is the slit of a spectrograph placed across a, um, a sunspot. So moving across here, spatially from the top, well, we see this splitting Increasing in magnitude out to through the through the umbra here to a maximum, coming back down through the penumbra and disappearing out in what we call the quiet sun. 
The Zeeman effect says that this splitting, the magnitude of that splitting is actually proportional to the magnetic field. And um, the polarity of the magnetic field causes a optical circular polarization when looking down through that field. So you can tell both the magnitude and the polarity of the magnetic field, which allows you to actually map out the magnetic field distribution on the surface of the sun. Now here is what's called a magnetogram, a magnetic map of the sun. I grabbed a few days ago from, uh, from the Solar Dynamics Observatory up in orbit. And uh, magnetograms have uh, been being taken routinely synoptically, starting again back at Mount Wilson with the Babcock magnetograph. This is starting in 1953. This is very familiar to all of you that hang out at uh, Mount Wilson. And what I'd like to point out is all these magnetic fields you see here are um, come in pairs. There's a plus polarity, let's call it north, and a south polarity. Um, in one hemisphere, the northern polarity will precede the southern polarity. Southern hemisphere, it's reversed. The south will uh, precede the north. And also notice that you can sort of get a sense that these, these magnetic regions are smeared out, kind of becoming diagonally smeared out towards the equator. Uh, that'll become important in a moment here. Also, I'd like to point out, oh good, this, the animated GIF I made is actually working. Um, you can see that um, sunspots correspond to the greatest magnetic flux density on the sun. Down here, a sunspot, here, a sunspot, sunspots there, up in this bipolar region, down here, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it's thought that the uh, magnetic field is formed by a dynamo down by plasma flows inside the solar atmosphere. Um, think of a dynamo, think of plasma flowing kind of like a current in this uh, solenoid here, creating a bipolar magnetic field. The details are still um, a little bit elusive, but uh, something called helioseismology has given us a great clue. Helioseismology is a study of acoustic waves inside the sun and how they refract through the, so the stellar, or in our case, solar interior by uh, analyzing what wavelengths are um, constructively interfering and destructively interfering. In other words, what uh, becomes a standing and a standing wave inside the sun. One can analyze such things as um, the temperature gradient as uh, the temperature increases in the solar interior. Acoustic waves are refracted back towards the surface. Likewise, with pressure, um, one can deduce flow rates inside the sun, uh, even magnetic fields. Uh, one of the great discoveries of helioseismology over the past several decades was that um, the flow rates inside the sun has a great discontinuity. You're probably, most of you at least, are aware that uh, the sun undergoes what's called differential rotation. The sun rotates faster than the poles. The right at the equator, it can be as fast as uh, like 25 days. As you go north and south latitudes, the rotation rate slows and slows to right at the pole can be all the way down to like 35 days. Helioseismology discovered that uh, there is a discontinuity right at the base of that convection zone. In the 
interface between the radiative zone and the convection zone, there is a shear where the uh, differential rotation occurs only in the convective zone and convection zone. Down in the radiative zone and down to the core, the sun is rotating all together like a solid body would. That creates quite a shear layer, what's called the tachocline, which is a big clue about where that dynamo is likely being generated. Now, again, uh, back to Mount Wilson once again. Um, Horace Babcock, who was the director of Mount Wilson and Palomar from 64 to 78, came up with at least a uh, qualitative explanation of the um, solar activity cycle. It's called the Babcock model. And how it in basically works is, again, picture the sun with a simple bipolar field. The uh, magnetic field lines are travel through the interior of the sun and are trapped up in that differential rotation plasma flow along around the equator. So these magnetic field lines get distorted, bent, pulled along parallel to the equator and stretched. As they're stretched, the, that imparts potential energy into the magnetic field lines and uh, after numerous rotations, the field lines get quite wound up around the sun. And uh, with all that potential energy, the convection has difficulty flowing through those. They can become uh, lower magnetic pressure inside the, uh, in there. The magnetic pressure can balance the, the uh, mechanical pressure. They can buoyant, get buoyant. They also can get kinked. And what you find is on the solar surface, some of these um, field lines can buckle and actually protrude up through the solar surface, up through the photosphere. Now you have a magnetic loop extending up into the corona. The uh, foot points of those coronal loops is where you tend to find sunspots. And why that is, is again, think of the convection coming up. It is a plasma. It is sensitive to magnetic fields. That magnetic field sticking up through the uh, through the photosphere diverts that uh, that convective flow upward around the side, so that part of the sun cannot get the refreshing hot material coming up. So it's still radiating away and uh, cools relative to the photosphere around it. Not to say that it gets cold, but it gets less hot around uh, maybe down to the temperature of a red dwarf. So still not something you want to stick your finger on. Um, there's a lot of potential energy built up in these coronal loops. And often these things can get twisted, etc. If they do twist, the uh, the field can see a lower potential by basically not a proper term, but what I like to think of as short circuiting across those foot points and releasing all that magnetic potential energy. That is the that is how we produce the flare and or coronal mass ejection. And uh, that releases a lot of that magnetic stored energy in these uh, wrapped up magnetic fields. Also, Notice that um, the, the foot points of these loops come in pairs, just like we saw in that magnetogram. Um, the, with relative polarity, where's my cursor? There'll be a relative north pole on one, one hemisphere to the south pole, the opposite in the other hemisphere. Now, the, uh, the relative south pole of the uh, active reach of that loop will be attracted to the local north pole and so it will be it will be dragged northward in this case well it's doing when that happens it will tend to cancel its magnetic field against other field lines likewise the relative north 
and the other hemisphere will be pulled towards its other opposite magnetic polarity, canceling out, and the uh, north and the south pole near each other will be repelled, the north by the north pole will be repelled towards the equator, the south mag um, polar region will be repelled by the south pole of the sun pushed towards the equator, that north and south will combine and cancel there. So after about 11 years with flares going on, releasing that magnetic field, coronal mass ejections, the regions, the um, bipolar regions rotating. And uh, you'll notice, you remember when you looked at that magnetic uh, magnetogram, you saw that it had that sort of scalloped look that uh, you easily see where that comes from now. After about 11 years of that, all that magnetic energy is released. What you find is you're left again with a simple bipolar field, but in this case now the the poles are reversed. The north is now down where the south pole is, the south is up where the north was, and the whole system starts up again. Um, that takes about 11 years. Again, this is a qualitative model, our uh, computer models haven't been able to reproduce a, an 11 year cycle very well, but uh, we're getting closer all the time. And so well, that brings us to the current state of the art, which again, unapologetically, I'm sticking with a Southern California bias here. And um, here shows kind of the state of the art of ground based solar astronomy. We have on the top here is the Big Bear Solar Observatory, Goody Solar Telescope. It's a 1.6 meter aperture telescope. Down below is the newly uh, first light completed Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope, which was um, designed and developed by the National Solar Observatory. It has a four meter aperture and was built on Haleakala in Maui, Hawaii. How am I doing on time? I guess I still have a little bit if I can get through this. Um, the Big Bear Goody Solar Telescope and DKIST are conceptually very similar telescopes. Designs are very similar, the biggest difference being the size. And that is not uh, by accident. Um, that is truly by design. Um, the Big Bear Goody Solar Telescope, which actually is run by New Jersey Institute of Technology, which went saw first light in 2009, um, was initially uh, justified and partially funded as a technology demonstrator and pathfinder for the Goody Solar Telescope. They are both off-axis Gregorian telescopes um, with uh, roughly F2 to F.26 mirrors, uh, a off-axis elliptical Gregorian concave secondary feeding down to Coudé labs down below. Um, I don't want to go into great detail here, but of course, the big difference between them is, of course, the aperture. The uh, GST, Big Bear, is a 1.6 meter F2.4 off axis Gregorian. The Daniel K. Inouye, typically just people just call it DKIST, is an F2 off axis Gregorian. So, what does that aperture give you is, of course, primarily resolution. In the middle of the visible, the uh, GST at Big Bear can resolve down to 57 kilometers. That's about 35 miles. Where in the visible, DKIS can go all the way down to 23 kilometers. Now, 
that may or may not be terribly important because we know that the sun has a smallest spatial scale. The sun is not a solid surface. It is a gaseous surface. Think of a cloud. It doesn't have a sharp, uh, sharp edge. It is a bit nebulous. And so we expect the, uh, the ultimate resolution to be right around where the GST is probably already hitting, at least maybe, or just right at that limit. Um, we will find out once uh, DKIS does a little better job. More importantly, though, um, DKIS can achieve that, pretty much that same resolution out in the near infrared, which there are some very important astronomical, uh, astrophysical spectral lines, ones particularly that respond extremely well to the Zeeman effect and are very sensitive to magnetic fields. Uh, DKIST, uh, well, first slide I say here was 2008. Uh, DKIST, 2019. Um, of course, right then is when COVID hit and uh, they are a bit behind. Um, another difference is, of course, uh, Big Bear is at about 2,000 meters, where DKIST is up at 3,000 meters. Uh, Big Bear is simply too low in the atmosphere to really be a coronal instrument. It's hoped that DKIST will be. However, development, the uh, Big Bear, 25 million over five years, uh, admitted last number I saw from the National Solar Observatory, $344 million over 20 years. Operations budget, about a million dollars per year for GST and round numbers last time I checked, 18 for DKIS. Um, you might, how am I doing on time? I'm, I'm running going. out of time. Um, you might be wondering how you have such a large telescope looking at the sun without, as uh, Tim pointed out, it vaporizing the side of your dome. Well, what uh, what is done in both telescopes is again, I say I said that uh, they are both of these telescopes are Gregorian designs, not a classical cast grain, not a Ritchie Crippian. You might have wondered why that is. Well, in a Gregorian, the you have access to the focus of the primary mirror, and at that foc which is ahead of the concave secondary mirror. At that focus, what you can do is you can put a um, reflective or um, some kind of an aperture stop that either absorbs or reflects away almost all the solar surface, allowing only a small part of the image through. Um, I don't have the numbers. Oh, I do on the next slide. Um, Big Bear uses a reflective aperture. It's a polished aluminum water-cooled um, surface that reflects away the uh, most of the image, allowing a three arc minute aperture at the center to pass through. So um, with a 1.6 meter, you're getting that solar constant. Uh, three C, your battery is running out. You're not plugged in. Um, uh, please plug in your, yeah. um, hopefully, um, excuse me, what's going on? Plug in here. Oh. I see it. Sorry about that. Uh, her, bath, her laptop is plugged into the wrong plug and uh, just about ran out of batteries. Um, so, uh, through that aperture, as I was saying, you get all the intensity, all the resolution of the telescope, just over a restricted field of view. That's three arc minutes for, uh, for Big Bear, at, uh, and that's rejecting about two kilowatts through that three arc minute surface. 
that's about a tenth the solar diameter. And uh, so you're rejecting almost all that two kilowatts, passing about a thousandth of that, about 20 watts on down to the other optics. That's handleable. At uh, DKIST, it's a five arc minute aperture, uh, which they have to reject 13 kilowatts of power, roughly. So with that, they don't reflect it away. They have a, a complex trap that uh, pulls and um, ports that heat away. Now, here is an example of the um, DKIS first light image versus one of the very early images off of uh, Big Bear's Goody Solar Telescope. Similar regions showing solar granulation. Uh, here's a, an outline of the continental US for scale. So, yeah, each granule is, uh, is about uh, 900 miles across, 15, call it 1500 kilometers. The characteristic life of a uh, granule is about 10 minutes. But you can see, okay, maybe DKIS is uh, light resolving slightly more. Also, this is using much more modern data reduction techniques than we than the than the uh, big bear images, but they are very similar, which is which you expect. As I said, we are really approaching the ultimate resolving limit in the visible of the uh, of the sun. Now, here is a movie of that early uh, Big Bear observation showing solar granulation. These, uh, again, each granule is has a characteristic life of about 10 minutes. You, When that plasma comes to the surface, it also carries with it magnetic fields, sweeps that to the side. And these bright points are regions of uh, magnetic fields that are being swept into the inner granular region, pushing that up the side and allowing you to see a little bit deeper down into the uh, solar solar interior where it's actually hotter. Uh, here we have an H-alpha image from, uh, from, again, all my data are from Big Bear because I had access to it. Here's an H-alpha image um, showing the chromosphere which uh, very well traces out the magnetic field lines coming through the chromosphere and uh, shows plasma flows. The chromosphere is, you'll see people quote anywhere from about 2,000 to 6,000 kilometers thick. It is a very uneven surface, and you kind of get that impression from looking at this. So I I used a uh, a midterm here about uh, 3,000 kilometers or 1,900-ish miles thick. Now we have what I think is just a phenomenal movie of H alpha of the sun and showing also. I hope your this isn't too choppy on your side. It is a phenomenal movie of H alpha from uh, from Big Bear. You can see. Uh, in the sunspot center, um, um, what's called umbral oscillations, show that again. You can see plasma flows along those magnetic field lines. And notice the, the, where the field lines just seem to sort of stop. That's really probably not that plasma isn't extending up there, but it's going into a temperature range where it's no longer emitting in the H alpha line, which is the uh, the uh, three to two orbital in the uh, hydrogen. Just the more I, I, I've watched this thing for probably hours, um, and every time you look at it, you see something different. We could spend the rest of the time just staring at this movie. Moving along, however, here is another uh, movie made from another spectral line of helium at 10A30 angstroms, which is formed. At the top of the chromosphere, it's a uh, also it's a more optically thin, but uh, that's a nice flare that you see going on. And again, it uh, very well traces out 
traces out the magnetic field lines through here. So you see this convoluted magnetic field structure, these loops forming up here. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of uh, potential energy bound up in that. The flare occurs, and then you get this reconnection, our beautiful arcade formed down lower. Oh, here's a photosphere movie of a uh, sunspot uh, at the resolving limit of uh, a Big Bear telescope. It shows uh, what we call a light bridge, which really you can see is convection worming its way up through the um, magnetic field lines forming the umbra. Inside the umbra, you see these bright points. Uh, here in great detail, you see flow in two directions along the, um, the penumbral region. Again, I, another movie you can get lost at staring at. Watch that one more time. And here you can see flow along the penumbral region out to where it's distorting the uh, granulation out at the edge. Let's move. Uh, lastly, here's uh, the Mercury transit from 2019. We, the uh, adaptive optics system locked on Mercury, again showing the granulation behind, which worked quite well till we. Well, it got to the edge. Uh, the data pipeline at Big Bear does not know how to deal with a uh, a big dark line like Terminator, so things went crazy. So thank you very much. That's my talk. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, thank you, Claude. That was uh, very illuminating. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> no, no, it was really. But one of the best talks we've had, seriously. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that. Um, it was kind of put together quickly. Claude, I have a couple of quick questions. One of them, you mentioned at some point, and I was a little surprised by it, that you said the radiation from the core takes... It was some yeah. ludicrous number, like a hundred, like a thousand years. How long did it take? It can take hundreds of thousands of years. For the radiation yeah. to move from the center of the core to the outer edge where we actually get it coming to us. Yes. Holy crap. Well, yes, that is, a, that is an incredibly counterintuitive point. <laughs> what, it's, what it says is that uh, the density inside the uh, convective zone is so high that a photon has what's called a mean free path of only a few centimeters before it gets scattered or absorbed and goes in it, then goes in some other direction. So it's basically just bopping around in, in around its uh, the point that it's at. However, there is just above it is just the minutest lower density versus below it. So it has just a slight a chance to go slightly further upward than when it's uh, scattered back downward. So even though it's traveling at the speed of light in there, it's going around, again, I, I, I picture a pachinko game where it takes, it's bouncing around, but ever so slowly making its way outward towards the um, edge of the radiative zone where convection takes over. And yes, that can take hundreds of thousands of years is what wow. uh, people that model that say. I have a good yeah. analogy for that, Richard. It's it's as if you went into a, a stadium full of people and you came in the south side and you have to go out the north side. But the and stadium is full. The stadium is full. It's standing room only. And every time you bump into somebody, you got to turn around and go in a different direction. And then you, when you bump into somebody else, you got to go around and turn into another random direction. So yeah, exactly. doing, doing that, it's going to take you a hell of a long time to get to the other side of the stadium. Yeah, um, no, I just I thought the random number... walk. This random walk is off is sometimes casually referred to as a drunkard's walk. You can imagine a drunk just sort of stumbling around, but not really getting anywhere. I, I resemble that remark. Uh, so I had one other question. You had a video of H A. 
Before we switch to the black and white images from obviously I'm assuming these uh, are monochrome cameras and then they're processed. But yes. you had a video that was completely and totally in color of the HA and it wasn't a specific one single color. It was like it was from either, you know, layers that were processed together or something, but it was a full color video, I think before this one. Um, uh, that was not a that video. One. There we go. This is not a video, it's just oh, a spill. Got it. it is a spill and I just colorized it. Oh, so okay. it's 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 accurate to say that the light that the sun is making at its core today, none of us will see in our lifetimes. And the light that we do see today was probably created when what? We were primates back in Africa? Uh, careful how you say primate, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> statistically, yes. However, of course, there's always a chance that one will find a uh, path through and uh, get through there in a fraction of a second. Ah. That's statistically unlikely, though. Mm -hmm. So, oh. so basically, yes. <clears throat> Anything amazing. else? I can stop sharing <clears throat> now. May I ask if the Parker Solar uh, probe uh, is uh, affecting your research? Uh, first of all, I am retired. I am not <laughs> doing any research. <laughs> and uh, secondarily, I, I always worked, my interest was in the region between the photosphere and the chromosphere, the temperature minimum region. Now, Parker Solar Probe, I have not been involved in. It's looking out at the corona and space weather stuff that uh, I am not involved in and I am far from an expert. That was okay. the, that was your way of saying you don't care anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we should probably end, we should probably end this and do our, our raffle. And uh, if we have some time at the end, uh, Claude, if you stay, because you might win something. You actually do uh, a couple of times. Um, Were we supposed to put our name in somewhere? Yes. Um, I haven't seen a link yet tonight. Is did Spencer leave? Well, his picture's there, but uh, no soup for you. One year. Let's see. <laughs> I can find. I can find that. Um, Did you go all the way up to the top? I think I should mute. <laughs> hmm. I don't see a link. Yeah, not tonight. All right, let me let me get it. See if you have it from before, maybe. Is is Alicia here? No, I don't see her. So Alicia's not here either. Well, hi, I'm back. Sorry, oh, there you I, I had to okay. step out. I had to step away. Um, okay, so I'm sorry. Oh, you didn't get my message asking you to to handle the raffle. Uh, we need oh. the link. Oh, oh. we need okay. the link. Hang on, let me let me pull it up real quick. Thanks, Spencer. All right. I'm sorry, Thanks, Spencer. I, I saw that, but I thought when you came in after your other meeting that you were just oh. going to be here. Otherwise, I'd have been more ready. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Hi, there it is. All right. There's the link. Okay. So the link's posted, but Alicia is not here either, yeah? No. Mm -hmm. We can okay. keep track of the winners. Okay. Right. And, right. and they'll so find out what, what they won. Right. This is going to be the, uh, the, the mystery gift from Alicia. Uh, Greg, do you want to take down the people? Where is he? Greg, will you take down the winners? Oh, absolutely. Let Thank me, you. Uh, All right. How many? Bed. How many are you going to have? How many are you going to have, Gerald? Um, we usually have about five. Spencer? He usually okay. does four or five, something like that. Yeah. Just making sure we're we don't go overboard. <laughs> yeah, thirty tonight. 20. Thirty tonight. <laughs> something for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> As you get a new car. <laughs> <laughs> we got 35 participants. We got 35 door prize. It'll take us for the rest of the okay. year. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think I got cars. The, All right. I got the spreadsheet ready. Okay. Let's see. So is everybody posting? Let's see. Let me repost the link one more time. Okay.
All right, let's see. <laughs> look, yeah, look, look under your seat. <laughs> okay, we've got how many people signed up? So we have 31 people uh, registered now. So how many people we have present? 35. 35. Okay. Well, I don't. Did you? Did you? I, I don't. I don't. I don't uh, register because <laughs> that could be a conflict of interest. <laughs> we should give Spencer a complimentary door prize. A free hat for Spencer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 uh. All right. Shall I close it out now? I've got thirty-one people registered. Yeah, go ahead. We're yeah, that's fine. Quarter two. Okay. Else, no one's fell asleep. Speak for okay. yourself. <laughs> okay let me just export let me just export it tim i love your new background well i figured I'll since we were talking snow. about the sun what the heck you know nice <laughs> hopefully that'll melt the snow up there mount wilson soon yeah we could use some snow melting by the way steve cooperman that is so freaking random <laughs> Hey Tim. Yeah, hey, I know Curtis part of hair. that scene. Hey Tim, okay. Curtis here. Yeah. We're up in Wrightwood over the weekend and the snow's almost gone in Wrightwood. Yeah. Wow. That was all cool. right. Yeah, it was the, the melt off is pretty quick. So it may be uh pretty sparse up at up at uh, Mel Wilson by now. Yeah. Okay, so I've just about get ring okay, I'm gonna share the screen with the uh spreadsheet on it. Here we go. All right, and let me drop the names in there. Okay, Jose Aguilar. It's the first one. Oh, did, so I won? Yeah. yeah. You, oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, you don't know what, what yet. But you you win a prize to be named later. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Hey, I didn't know we were playing baseball. <laughs> Claude. Oh. All right. Yay. Yay, one for our speaker. Yeah. <laughs> All right. How do you hang on? Don't delete it yet. His last okay. name is Plymate. Uh huh. Yeah. P L Y M A T. Okay. Not primate. Yeah, I got that joke. <laughs> That's why you were sensitive about that. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to figure that one out. I never okay. have problems. Oh, Andy Sway. Andy Sway. Nice. Yep, I'm here. And yeah, Teresa pointed out that I uh, put my, I had a typo as I was panicking to put my email in. <laughs> we'll, we'll find you. Hey, Andy, you won a door prize, but we don't know what it is because Alicia's not here. Okay. Right. I'll take the telescope. Okay. Dan, <laughs> Dan got it. Next. And that's Ben. Ben, hey, ben, ben Yeah. Okay. Are you here? -E -D I didn't see you. N A R. -S -S yeah, he's there. Okay. Okay. Cool. How many more? Let's see. One more. Ah, Nady. All right, Nady. Nady. St stay on that for a second. Okay. That's a, that's a hard one to spell. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. He said trying to cover yeah. an extra minute to write this name down. Mm -hmm. Olivera. Is that? O L I V E I R. Yeah, I'm here. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's five if you want to do five prizes. Jose, Claude, Andrew, Dan, and Irene. Nady. 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 Oh, Nady. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Great. Congratulations well, um, to our winners we could tonight. Probably, we could probably end the, the recording. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, if there's yeah. still some people who want to hang for a while, we got another, well, maybe 10, 10 minutes, 20.